students there in Mexico, you know, in a small town, said, uh, there's gringos, you know, in the soccer field. So I went to, uh, we all, a group of us got together and got to see from afar in the soccer field a, a, a group of, of, of white people. I've never seen white people before. None of us have. So I was intrigued. Um, so I mean, that, that, that's the kind of world that I, I grew up in. And then at the age of, of nine, I, I, I came to the U.S. My father had been undocumented, crossed the border illegally, settled up in Sonoma County. So I had never met the gentleman. Uh, and then I became, I graduated from La Museca to become a farm worker. So I grew up among a diverse group of folks when I came to the U.S. It was uh, four white people, referred to as Okies by some folks, um, four blacks, uh, Filipino men who were not allowed to marry, uh, who lived next door in the ranch, uh, and, um, and and so forth. And, and then Mexican Americans who were, came from migrants who came from Texas, and uh, and from the San Joaquin Valley, from Riverside. So that's how I grew up. Um, and one of the things that, that was really, uh, for me, fascinating as a kid, nine years of age, was that uh, you know there was very little communication uh, among us in terms of you know radio or anything, and so I remember we used to wake up at three, three, four in the morning 
to go to work in, in, in the fields, uh, we would listen to uh, an AM station out of uh, San Jose, KLOK. It's up in Sonoma County, north of the Bay Area. And so that's how I grew up, with a fascination of, of media and, and radio. And then back in um, oh, about 1964, my brother set up the first Spanish language radio, uh, local radio service in, in uh, Sonoma County, Napa, what is now the wine country. We used to be prune pickers at the time. And so there, I learned the power of mass media through radio. And all of us there, we were probably maybe, maybe a couple thousand at that time, living in Napa, Sonoma, most of the summer, who, you know, migrated. And everybody in the, in, you know, if you were eight, the age of six and older, would tune in to this radio show on Sundays, which was traditional music, intercepted with news and information. And I remember my brother had the AP. I used, my job was to put the AP wire in English. He would translate, uh, you know, uh, live simultaneously, like he do his own newscast by himself, do the engineering and all that. So I was really fascinated by that. You know, I ended up at Harvard College and then Harvard Law School and did radio there. And of course, it was very interesting for me that I had a, we, as a group, had a lobby the student radio station to give access to us, to our <coughs> students, to do programming for the university. Uh, Latino programming, and of course the masses of Puerto Ricans and Dominicans that lived in, in the greater Boston area. It was a struggle that I think well, they were shaped by the Crimson, which is the college, uh, the college uh, newspaper. So you know, so that's where you know again one of the challenges that I faced for for, for diversity, if you may. Uh, the, and then when uh, I grew up as a farm worker. So all through college and law school, I went back and lived in the, in the farm fields in, in, in the, in the uh, uh, neighbor camp where I grew up with my family. Because I thought it was important to, to get a sense about, maintain that sense of pulse of where people were. Because I wanted to serve those people. I grew up among these people. It's a real challenge for people like myself who grew up among poor people that once we get access to privilege, that we never come back or look back. And, and I was part of that generation who said no to that. And so I wanted to be there as long as I could. So comes Rodney Bilingue in 1976. I have a graduate from Harvard Law School. I go to Fresno. Uh, Southern King Valley has a larger concentration of farm workers in the United States. And so that's where I start Rodney Bilingue with a group of uh, people from LA. There's somebody here from uh, LA and who went to one of the communication schools here in LA named Bobby Paramo and other farm workers uh, from the valley, and then myself. I was, I was the only immigrant. Everybody else was a Mexican-American, first or second generation. So it was very interesting. Uh, we started on July 4th, 1980. We broadcasted a first station out of Fresno, covered most of the Southern King Valley, and we, and we, did, uh, we did start on July 4th because uh, in celebration of, of our right to exercise our First Amendment rights, freedom of speech, and so we chose that day to go on the air. And we consider ourselves who, but we are, Americans. So that's a, the affirmation that, that, we, that we did. And so I think one of the, the key things, again, at that time, as we started the service, that we wanted cultural information, cultural programming, content, but also news and information was so critical because the English language media did not provide it for us, nor the Spanish language media. If you look, for example, even today, tune in to Spanish language media and understand what's happening, there is no news in Spanish today in the commercial band in Spanish. And when it's, it's, it's sad. In fact, as time progresses, you know, since the 80s, it's less and less information in, in the, you know, across the United States and radio. So that's what drove us to involve Rodney. We also wanted something authentic that would reflect on who we are. You know, there's no reason why we can't do it. That's what I, that's what troubled me as a child, as as a prune picker. Is like, wait a minute, I go to school and people don't understand who I am. I'm the only Mexican farm worker in this college prep school, and nobody understands who I am. And everybody knows I take the bus with them, but somehow they don't come to visit. They don't understand. They can't talk to my parents. My parents don't speak English, and it's just it's just anyway. So I've been a real translator of sorts in my life. And I think this carries on to even this project <coughs> to some extent. So um, anyway, so I have also, um, uh, I also realized that the new technology, 
I'm not well versed on it. But then I have a team of Buto, <laughs> Max, and others, you know, Oscar, who are really, and others who are really, you know, at, you know, participants and 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 of, of all that. And so that that's so now I realize that in all through that period, you realize if you want to do something. It isn't one individual. It's really a team. That's what makes things happen. Um, and I think, uh, you know, and that has been something that actually has driven me to, to try to, uh, to serve Los Angeles. 1979, we've been coming to, to LA trying to organize something without success. This is our current audience. We have six full power FMs that we operate, three in the Southern King Valley, one in Salinas Valley, one up in uh, Mendocino County, up in north, the Redwood Empire, another one at the US Mexican border, the Pure Valley is just 100 miles uh, east of uh, uh, San Diego. Then we have 100 stations that are affiliates throughout the US, maybe taking a newscast called Noticiero Latino, a Spanish language newscast, which is not a reflection of what's coming up in the LA Times or the New York Times but rather it's a complementary menu of, of news happening in LA, San Antonio, Dallas, Texas, New York, Chicago, Mexico City, about what's happening in our world of Latinos that impact us. So that's what's there. And then we have a national talk show in Línea Abierta, La Talk of the Nation, that's a reflective of our own needs in terms of education, in terms of uh, uh, immigration, in terms of, of human rights and so forth, uh, you know, health care and so on. And, uh, and so here, for example, you see uh, who, who listens to Ravi Bilingue, which is in the color box, and who listens to the NPR affiliate according to age. You notice that 12 to 34, right, how, how many of, uh, you know, this is just one county, Tulare County. It's according to Arbitron. You see how it's a much younger population, okay? And that is very, very significant because that's who we want. That's who Latinos are. We're a younger population as opposed to the white population. Uh, okay. And listen. And look at who, in terms of ethnicity, who's listening to us and who's listening to NPR, in, because it's only one affiliate there. Almost no Latinos are listening to NPR in a county that is majority Latino. Okay, so what we're doing, because we're part, we're part of the public broadcast, is we're bringing in new audiences. We have experience in doing that. That's what we're doing, and we're challenging the system to to go to do it. Um, if you, this is demographics today of Los Angeles County, Fresno County, and California, and you see. Um, the Latino population, for example, close to 50% in LA and, and Fresno County, and, uh, and California around what, a little bit over 35%. This is what's going to be in 2050 according to, uh, you know, the demographers. Um, Latino is going to be in 2050, what, 72% in LA, Fresno, close to I mean, 60, yes, 60 plus. I mean, and look at the white population. Look at that. I mean, that's 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 what's ahead. That's why we have this research. You know, that's why this project is so important. <coughs> at the same time, I think that comes with with a challenge about how do we, how how does the Latino population as a new majority deal with issues like the environment? Deal with issues like education. Deal with issues like human rights. Deal with issues like the First Amendment. Okay, when 50% of Latinos are dropping out of high school, it's a real challenge. And as we're going to find out from Max and, and Nicole, how do we reach it? Because these folks are not listening to to public radio in English in LA. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to. To Max, before I do, I just want to say again, it's individuals and, and that, that are making this happen. And if it wasn't for, I know I and other members of the Rodney Legal team, they come here to Fresno, I mean from Fresno over here to organize it. But it really has taken Frank Cruz, a gentleman who's on the board of, of, of this university, to really push this. He's been on the board of CPB. He was on the board for 12 years, and I think he turned out a couple years ago. But it, this is really his dream. 
to have a Latino service here in Los Angeles. And so we went to him. And of course, the Corporation for Broadcasting, you have the dean of, 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 this, of this school, uh, Ernie Wilson, who is the chairman of that board, which is, is, is providing the, 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 not only the encouragement, but the financial support. And of course, Pat Harrison, the, the uh, president of CPB, who has uh, a new um, initiative for innovation and diversity. Uh, even within his own staff, and of course Bruce Theriel, the head of radio, and Vinny Curry, the head of uh, operations. So, give Trimmer to Max to tell us more about the project. Great. Thank you, Ugo. And um, I just want to point out that you see the heritage that this uh, project, uh, you know, has uh, evolved from, uh, the Radio Bilingue heritage, and that's very important, and I'll return to that later. One of the things that has happened to this project, because of the CPB support that Ugo's mentioned, is that we have the luxury of having a very robust research and marketing uh, uh, component. And so what I'm going to share with you is, um, excuse me, is, is the opportunity that's there. And um, just to follow up on what Ugo was showing to you, uh, there, the, our market <coughs> is the 25 to 40 year old demographic, multi-ethnic. And um, we, we look at the uh, chart here, we can see that uh, 1.3 million in the 25 to 40 year group is Latino here in, in the LA metro market, 1.3. But we're also focusing on African Americans and Asian Americans. And we, we put together, if you look at the numbers, the African American uh, community in this age group, 180,000, and Asian Americans, 392,000, over a half a million just for those two groups. We have a potential audience of 1.8 million here that, that we can uh, you know, uh, say would be our audience. And that's, that's very important to keep in mind. That, and the interesting part that we've also found out in both our focus groups and in the research is there's a tremendous hunger. And very similar to what um, Ugo uh, was talking about in terms of people wanting to identify with where they come from, we have found that people who want to keep their ethnic traditions and culture alive, this, people who find that very important, they are the people that want to have a service like this. Um, and that's Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans, 81% of them, their cultural traditions and ethnic traditions are important to them. And we're, we're going to feed into that. Of the people that we surveyed, and this was a very large group, and this was just our first study. Our study has four very large components. But this was the market study. 91% of them, they are interested in news and current affairs. And also, they feel they're not getting it now in the outlets that exist. Let's look, though, at here in LA, at uh, Latinos in particular, and African Americans and Asian Americans in the group that we surveyed, 25 to 40. Only 15% of them listen to KCRW. 14% listen to KJAZZ. Many of you know that station, great jazz station, predominantly African American. KPCC listened by 13%. KUSC 11%, KCFK 8%, and the stations out in the Inland Empire are even lower. But uh, you have to really take this in to realize the opportunity, to realize the, the need. They're not listening to the current uh, NPR stations. What about KCT and the other stations uh, that broadcast PBS programming? Latinos 18 plus in the LA market, 65% do not even watch KCET. 83% do not watch KOCE, 84% do not watch KLCS, the uh, you know, LAUSD station. Again, a uh, very small percentage of viewers in watching these. Another area of opportunity for us, many of you may already know this, but young Latinos and African Americans and Asian Americans are over-indexed in terms of online and mobile. And what we found here is something, and, and Ugo has worked for many years in, in building and bringing broadband access to underserved uh, communities. And of the people that we surveyed, the ones who have a computer at home, 96% are uh, on either high speed or broadband. And this is really important because part of our launch is going to be online when we start. So we know that our audience is there. Again, the benefit of the research. <laughs> Now, for those who have a uh, cell phone, do you text message? 87% do. 
Again, you know, those of you who are in the demo already, you know that that is really where you get your news and information, and uh, you know, your your social life might even be on there if you if you uh, use Twitter and, and other social media. And what about mobile internet access? Again, we see that it's pretty high for those who have a cell phone with mobile internet access. 59% of them are, are using this, and uh, they plug into news content at 70%. So what does that tell us? We see the hunger. We see that there is a big gap in what's already out there that's not serving the audience. We see that they're online, and we see that they're you know, using the mobile to get their news. So it begins to give us a lot of direction about what we're going to do and how this service is going to be presented, which uh, Nicole will talk about a little bit more uh, when she's uh, discussing this. But another important thing, as you all know, in public radio and public media, is somebody has to support it. We're very fortunate that CPB has given us a five-year commitment, but at some point, this audience is going to have to step forward. And as we saw in the situation with Haiti, people are willing to step forward. People are willing to actually donate over their uh, mobile device. And that net likely level at 60%, according to our researchers, is very high. And so again, there's a real opportunity there for us to be able to get support from people who depend on online and mobile for their news and information. Of course, we can build you know, the best uh, service in the world, but if we don't drive people there, if we don't do uh, a marketing that resonates with this group, uh, we are not going to be able to have an audience and build an audience and keep an audience. So in order to have a marketing that really works, we've developed a branding strategy, and I'll very quickly go through this, because it's very important that we know what we want to provide to our audience and how we want to brand our service. You just heard from Hugo what the, the genesis of Artie Belinger is, and it's really about social awareness. And so our first point in branding is purpose and action. Every action we take has to reinforce our purpose. And our purpose is to serve our audience, serve the community in LA, and serve the world. And I believe that's the kind of thing that resonates today. That's why people responded to, to Haiti as they did, to Katrina as they did, etc. People want the world to be better, and they want to have a role in that. Authenticity. This is very important. This has always been a staple of Radio Bilingue, and now we're bringing it into the new project. We want to truly represent Latinos, <laughs> African Americans, and other ethnic groups by creating an authentic and participatory experience for our listeners and users. We definitely want to be innovative. We often say that this project is the nexus of diversity and innovation, and whether it's in content or platform, platform we're going to do it. We're going to break out of the mold. We're going to think out of the box. Credible and casual. And this is something that uh, give credit where credit's due. That Oscar Garza always talks about, and I really like it. We're going to take a relaxed and formal approach. Because one thing we heard in the focus groups a lot is we don't want to hear the news from our parents. We don't want our dad or our mom to tell us what's, you know, the news. No, we want to hear it from our own, you know, generation in our own voice. So we're going to take a relaxed and formal approach, but it's based on very solid journalism. When you have people like Nicole running the content, you're going to have solid journalistic approach. And finally, we also learned in our focus group, people want to be entertained. They want to be informed, but they want it to be entertaining. They uh, want us to be creative and ingenious in how we present the news and information. And now I'm going to turn it over to Nicole, because as we know, I guess, <laughs> content is king. First, I want to thank everybody for, for welcoming us and, and coming here to listen to us speak. Uh, and some of what I plan to say kind of mirrors what my colleagues have said. And, and you know, the first important you know part is to talk about some of the slides that you saw and to just really sit and think about those numbers. That there's really a 1.8 million people there who I kind of look at as a potential audience for us who, as we see from the slides, you know, you look at that KCRW number, and out of all the public radio stations here in Los Angeles, they have the highest amount, and it's only 15%. They're only reaching 15% of our target audience, of 25 to 40-year-olds, largely Latino, but also with African Americans and Asian American mixed in. And that says to me that there's a whole audience out there who's ready, who wants content, but who doesn't have content. 
And so that's what we're really trying to do, is we're really looking to seek that void. And how are we doing it? First and foremost, you know, when you think about what you just saw in the slides about um, people of color over-indexing when it comes to whether it's social media networks or online usage or even mobile. So what we're doing and what we decided very early on is that, you know, what we have to do from the very beginning is multi-platform. That means, you know, not setting out as lots of media organizations do to either be just radio and then decide what an online strategy is going to be or just TV and then decide. But we're approaching it all at once and saying what kind of service can we create that our target audience, who we know is online, that is on, you know, listening to the radio, that they can find us without having to try too hard. And so that's a lot of what we're working on. You know, first and foremost, I should mention that when it comes to the content, we're looking at content that is news and information. You know, what we know from our focus groups is that there's an appetite for news information, despite what you may hear in the, in the press saying that young people don't care, they don't want to know what's going on in the world. We disagree with that. We think they do care. But what we also know about our target audience is that they're not getting it from mainstream news sources. And if they're not getting it from mainstream news sources and they're not getting it, you know, whether it's on the commercial side or on the public <coughs> media side, then it's our goal and it's part of what we're here to do is to provide it for them. You know, and for us, you know, news and information, music and entertainment, those are all things that we're planning on covering and that we're gearing up to covering. And our approach is very simple. You know, we're looking at it through the lens of this community. You know, we're looking to capture the pulse of these different ethnicities here in Los Angeles. And what we're doing, you know, when I think about um, when we started to add staff, uh, add producer staff, and one of the things that I'm instilling in them from the very beginning is, you know, to take a look when they pitch story ideas, to think about, okay, how does this relate, even if it's a mainstream story making news like Haiti, I encourage them, how does it affect each of these communities that we're, that we're focusing on? And, you know, I think always when you talk about diversity and particularly uh, any service that's looking to approach it from a multicultural perspective, a natural question arises. And that question usually is, well, how much of it is Latino? How much of it is African American? How much of it is Asian American? And, how, and also, how do you capture the diversity that exists within each of those individual communities? Do I have the perfect answer? No. But what we do know is that our goal here is to represent communities of color here in Los Angeles. And that means, you know, and again, remember what we saw in those slides that when it comes to people of color here in Los Angeles, the majority is Latino. And so we made a very conscious decision that the majority of stories that we do will be through the lens of the Latino community here in Los Angeles. That doesn't mean we're going to ignore the African American community or the Asian American community. But a lot of what we will do, a lot of what we will do will be through that lens. And I think what we're finding already, you know, as we start to, you know, we're in the process now of doing piloting, so doing everything from looking for hosts um, to also, you know, deciding what our editorial voice is going to be. You know, what is our tone? You know, as Max mentioned, we're looking at credible but casual, which means a heavy emphasis on news and information, but also doing it differently than mainstream news, going into the communities, hearing what, what's on their mind. So it is different from what they would hear, you know, from what everybody in this room would hear on KCRW or KPCC. And so it's really integral in, in, in what we're doing and in the sound that we're trying to create, that we be in touch with the community, that we go out. We've been sending producers out into the field to get a sense of what's going on in the minds of the community. And also setting our own agenda. You know, with what we do, you know, we're working on a, on a one-hour uh, pilot show, and we're saying, okay, let's not look at what the LA Times is doing, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of their front page. What's our front page? What's going on in our communities? What are the people, what is our target audience? What's important to them today? What is the story that they're talking about that they want to know more about? You know, it can be an angle of a story or it can be something very specific to the communities that we're looking to cover. And that's something that's really setting us apart uh, from other media organizations. And the last thing that I wanted to mention, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the multi-platform and what that means to us. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it's definitely with an emphasis on knowing that Yes, we're, you know, we're funded as a radio service, so that's a bulk of what we're going to be doing. But also, we can't ignore that our audience is online. You know, when I look at my friends, I'm in the target audience. I'm smack dead in the middle of the target audience. And I know that I get a lot of my news online, that my friends get a lot of their news online. And not just online on their physical computers, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, but also on the phones. You know, they're checking sports scores on their phones. They're communicating with their friends on phones. 
I have friends that send me links to articles, links to YouTube on the phone. And so the big, our biggest challenge is, okay, how can we create a service, how can we create content that we don't think of as just being a part of a one hour show, but content that can exist in podcast form. You know, something that can be played on somebody's computer. Content, actual text that people can go to our site and retrieve. How can we make it fast paced? One of the things that we know about our target audience is they want something fast. They don't want to sit through, you know, a traditional 10, 8 to 10 minute, you know, NPR piece. They want a whole block to be 8 to 10 minutes. They want all their news in 8 to 10 minutes. So what does that mean about how we structure things? How does, what does that mean about how we program you know, everything from the radio show to the website to the content that we make available you know, on the phone, on mobile? Um, it also has completely revolutionized the way that we think. I mean, as, as Ugo mentioned, you know, we don't, our content needs support. We're public media. And part of public media, as you guys probably are well aware, is that it's funded by the public. So that's another part of what we're starting to think about when, when we think about content, is how do we raise money for this venture? How can we use mobile, either mobile text donations, or how can we think outside the box and bet a way for uh, our audience to donate in a media player? You know, so it's really challenging us to think outside the box. And we're really, I, I think we're getting there. You know, we're, we're in the process of you know, figuring out what our media strategy, what our digital media strategy is going to be, what our distribution channels are, and so I think we're, you know, we're definitely, you know, on the right, on the right track. Fascinating. Great. So, questions, comments? Mm -hmm. I want to focusing on 25 to 40. <coughs> I mean, as someone who's outside the... <laughs> <laughs> Someday you'll be 25. You'll get there. <laughs> Four years, you'll get there. Someday I'll be an adult, just like me. <laughs> Do you want to address that from a research research? Right, and well, what began, this study, it, it began as a gleam in the eye of Frank Cruz, as, as Ugo mentioned, but uh, CPB commissioned a study that was done, and that study, which was a research study done in 2006, the focus was that this was the audience uh, that had the greatest need and that was not being served by uh, NPR. The NPR audience and the PBS audience, as you know, its average age is 62, quite uh, college educated and they found that this was a big gap within this age group so that's why it was selected based on that research. Google? Uh, yeah well further also uh, what happens is actually the, the, the research firm gave us several opportunities you know in terms of who we could we could serve and one was to just serve the Latino population which was the initial how would I say vision for the service and the other one was to go across cultural and what happened in terms of the Latino population, actually the younger you were within this age group, the more likely you identify with a, with a cross-cultural program uh, or service uh, as opposed to older. So, so then we saw the opportunity, it was essentially the same amount of, of folks, potential audience within either, you could say Latino deep, in other words, you go cross-generational, you know, 1.8 million, or Latino and then African American Asian. It was that choice. So I think part of it is philosophical on our on our part. We think that there is a responsibility by Latinos to reach out to African Americans and Asians to be a, a, a uniting uh, you know platform and, and take the leadership on this. And, and so it, it's it's an affirmative way for us as Latinos to reach out as an institution. Um, and, and, and it just happens that Lati the younger Latinos are more accepting of, of a, of a multi-ethnic uh, world. And uh, so, anyway. Yeah, and I wanted to add one thing and, 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 and they are also more likely to, to be interested in news and information. That's very true. And one of the things that I wanted to add to that is we did, so far we've done seven focus groups. We've done four Latino focus groups, an African American focus group, an Asian American focus group, and a Native American focus group. And one of the things that was very encouraging to us and, and led, uh, you know, in part to our decision to make it, to uh, focus in on more of a multicultural audience, is that a lot of what we heard in those focus groups across race um, was that there was an interest in having a service that reflected the diversity in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that Latin, even Latinos who've given the choice between a Latino service and a multicultural service said, you know, we want the multicultural service. Not hands down, not, you know, 100% of them, but a considerable amount said, we want something that reflects our experience here in LA. We want to hear about the Lakers. We want to hear about, you know, 
going from I'm having Mexican food tonight, but I'm having Korean food tomorrow, and the next day I'm having soul food. You know, the experience, you know, how people look at LA. You know, they look at it as a, as a you know, I hate the term, but melting pot. And so that really spoke to us and said, oh, you know, maybe there's something here. Maybe that's where we need to kind of zero in. Can I just pursue that? Because I was thinking that too when you were showing the charts. I mean, this is such an appealing thing, and I think you're exactly right for most young people. That would be the appeal. This is LA, it's multicultural. And yet, it does sort of go hard up against your chart that said people want, you know, culturally rich references to their own experience. So you have to sort of think about, you know, if this is going to be heavily Latino culturally rich. How much meaning does that have for the African American or the Asian American, and where do they get the heavily African American or Asian American culture rich? I, mean, I, think, what, I think what we found as we started to produce content is that, um, you know, a lot of times the media kind of plays up the differences between communities, particularly communities of color. But what we're finding is that there are more similarities than there are differences, and that there are ways, you know, obviously if there's a situation very unique to the Latino American community you know, that will be a very specific story, just in the same way as that there may be issues that are very specific to African American communities or Asian American communities. But what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to set the tone in our, no, in our newsroom that we have to look at it across ethnicities and say, okay, this is an issue here. Is it an issue in one of these other communities as well? And if so, how can we have a good, solid dialogue about that that is encompassing, that is, you know, because I know that I've listened to um, stories about the Latino community, and I've been able to relate as an African American. You know, the, the issues in the African African American community may be somewhat different, but even that's new. You know, even that's new to an audience that's used to hearing, you know, very mainstream stories. You know, that's appealing, um, and I think that was one of the encouraging things about the focus groups and, and playing for them already existing content and hearing that. You know, for example, one of the one of the things that we tested was the Michael Eric Dyson show, produced out of Baltimore, W E A A. And it was very interesting to hear the response among Latinos who said, I would listen to that, that's great. And, and his show is very specific to African Americans and the African American experience, but there were things that people were able to relate to. You know, we played them some content from Mandalit del Barco at NPR, and you know, the African American and Asian Americans said, hey, that's great, you know, I'm interested in that, I'm engaged in that. So it's funny because a lot of the assumptions that we have about multicultural audiences and what are the audience interested in, are they interested in only you know, things that are very specific to them. Yes, they want that, but they're also accepting of the diversity, you know, as long as we're able to provide it. Interesting. Sandy? Yeah, I was um, curious to, to hear a little more about sort of the relationship between, in, in a sense, the content and the demographics compared to, say, the roots around the bilingue and, and Salinas and Tulare County. You know, you have a, more of a farm workers community, a, a greater degree of poverty, obviously. Um, and then here you have, a, a, in terms of the Latino community, obviously a much wider range uh, in terms of class, in terms of occupation and everything. So I, I guess I'm curious to know a little bit more about the, how, what, what the roots of the rather bilingual content and approach to news, how that would be carried forth in the new venture. Well, you know, it's very, it's very interesting because um, I didn't show this uh, the, another slide, which is part of the study in Tulare County, which shows that uh, that actually uh, the public uh, Latino public radio service, which is Radio Bilingua, actually is very much a reflective a reflection of the demographics in there in terms of of education level, for example. So that what happens is that the bulk of the people uh, you listening are from households twenty five thousand dollars and less, it's fifty percent. But then, and, and so it, uh, and also this corresponds to high school education as well. In other words, 50% of our audience in Tulare County has a high school education or less. But, and, and, and so that's the bulk, but what happens is the people with college and graduate degrees, you know, it comes up again. In other words, in other words, the, 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 the rally movement manages to catch that were educated as well in Spanish for using information especially and, and cultural information. So serving that class is not is not alien to us, you know, but rather rather bilingue the way it was set up originally is that as as we know, the media segmented, particularly beginning in the like the late seventies, eighties. And so what we wanted to do was to bring our community together. Plus frequencies are rare, you know, like radio frequencies and T V frequencies. 
And so what we wanted to do is use Rally Gleam as a way to bring the family together. For example, a, a, we have, for example, a beginning at 10 p.m. to, to, to uh, 2 a.m., all these big goodies in English. For to whom? It was the lowriders here in, you know, like in L.A. and all through the, you know, some King Valley, Salinas Valley, and, and people in some of that prison. I mean, if you look at who's, who's, who's in the Tehachapi, who's in all these prisons, I mean, it's Latinos and African Americans. I mean, you know, so those people are just tuning in to Rally Bolingwood. So we have succeeded. Part of the reason why I wanted to, to put those slides was also to, to demonstrate how Rally Bolingwood, in fact, manage to accomplish what we set out to do back in 76. We just set out to serve the whole family, and, and, and that's what we are doing. So, so this, in this case, I think what happens is that in each case we want to provide authentic, authentic programming. CBB put out RFP, uh, uh, which we had no influence over, which was to serve Latinos in English. <coughs> we wanted to make sure, and that's what we bid on this, we responded to our RFP, that this programming would be authentic. So we responded to that in, the, in that context. Because that's a real challenge for us. You know, we, uh, because if, if, if somebody else was to do it, it was not authentic, that would be a real, real challenge for us as Latinos, not just in LA, but nationwide. So we, we thought it was really important for us to, to be part of it. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, no, no. Right, Anani, and, uh, but Pete, I think I gave Pete the signal, so let's go with Pete and Anani, yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the content you're producing for some of the pilot shows that you're working on? Well, um, I'd actually would say to you that right now, kind of where we are in the process, I can tell you more about the process of how we're selecting stories. You know, this week, for example, we're kind of going into the studio and doing a couple of pilots. You know, and what we're looking at is, you know, kind of going back to what I said earlier about trying to find that good combination of, you know, national stories through the lens of the community, but also local stories. So to give you a couple of examples of, this, of some of the stories that we're working on, last week we did an interview with uh, former uh, Olympic athlete Dominique Dawes, who is a three-time medal winner, three-time Olympian, African, first African-American uh, gymnast to win an individual medal back in the 90s. And what we talked to her about was about the diversity at the Winter Olympics and how if you look at the Winter Olympics, you don't see a lot of people of color. And so we took the opportunity, since she was there in Vancouver, to have a conversation with her about why is that? Um, you know, why don't we see people of color? How do we get there? What was it like for you, um, you know, back in the 90s to be, you know, a young African American woman um, who was winning, you know, who was winning medals? What was that? competition like we know that that we know that the Olympics are always high pressure situations what about the added pressure of being you know quote unquote the one and talking about that uh, so that's give, kind of gives you one example of how our coverage is slightly different from you know the mainstream coverage we've also been covering um, a story out of commerce California and efforts there to you know expand the 710 freeway and to get rid of you know the, the the cargo trains that are going through there, that's causing quite a bit of health problems for its local residents and soot, you know, an, an inch high every day from the trucks, and what you know a local community-based organization called East Yard is doing to try to fight that, to try to change you know to, to try to change the rules there in that city because its residents, who are largely people of color, you know, are suffering as a result. They're suffering from health problems, you know, and obviously if if this, the expansion of the 710 freeway goes through. That means displacing a large percent, a large percentage of, of the residents. And the last story that I'll mention to you for now is a story that um, we've been covering on the census and what uh, local community-based organizations and other folks here in Los Angeles are doing to encourage Latinos to take part in the census. So what we did was we had um, a Latino hip-hop artist, Malverde, um, who is, a, is an immigrant himself and He's been working with Voto Latino and actually himself going door to door and encouraging people um, to become involved with the census. So those, those should give you a little bit of a sense of what we're doing. And I should also add on to that, that the way that we've been doing the interviews, with the exception of the Dominique Dawes interview since she was in Vancouver um, and we weren't able to get a, you know, a, a camera in front of her, but the other two uh, stories that I just mentioned, you know, the, the, the interview with La Verde, we videotaped. So that will go on, you know, we're working on a development blog, that will end up on our development blog. Um, 
when it comes to going out into the field, you know, for the commerce story. When I sent producers down there, they were down there with audio equipment to capture audio, but video equipment as well, and also still cameras so that they could take pictures. So that story, when it's completed, will be a true multimedia experience. There will be the, the audio piece that we, could, that we could very easily run on radio. There will be the online piece, which may take a couple of different forms. You know, it may be an audio slideshow. It may be a video piece. It may be a montage. You know, so again, going back to our approach is multi-pronged. You know, we're trying to, as we cover stories, think how, how many different ways can we cover this? Yeah, I was just curious about um, the economics role in, in your demographics here. I just saw S. Craig Watkins from the University of Austin speak, and he was talking about the, um, you know, profound shift from 1999 to the present in terms of, uh, you know, mobile and, and internet access, and that he really pretty much showed by pure numbers that Latinos are going to drive the new wave of social media and how it's going to work. So that, that was one thing he was proposing. But, but this was all kind of based on numbers from 2008, et cetera. And I just wonder when we get into lower economic communities where we're looking at a 30% unemployment rate, how I can imagine the radio pieces being accessible. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm just wondering whether this is something that they're considering, whether this is some, you know, will this stop this ability to get into these communities? How, how is CPB addressing that? And is something you guys thinking about or talking about? Well, I think it's definitely a part of what we've worked into our approach, being a multi-pronged approach. Um, and we've definitely thought about the economy. You know, I think you're right, you know, when it comes to radio being an, an, an easy way for people to access it. But we're also looking at, that's why one of the things that we're focusing quite a bit of our attention, and, and probably more attention than most um, public media outlets uh, pay attention to, <laughs> the mobile aspect. You know, what about people who are lower on the socioeconomic um, uh, chain and who may not have full-time access or a lot of access to laptop computers or desktops. That's why we're trying to figure out a way to reach them via their mobile phones. Because increasingly what we're seeing in the numbers, you know, the research bears out that they're on their phones. They have cell phones. They're using them to text. So we're, we're actively <coughs> trying to figure out how can we really take advantage of that? How can we really make that as, uh, make that a priority in how we distribute content? Well, you know, I mean, media segmented, and, 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 and even though we're saying we're trying to do away with some of the segmentation along ethnic lines, in fact, we are segmenting along, shall we say, class lines, the educational, because this is for a, some college education or more. I mean, the, the, that's the demo. So we're not talking about, in this service, uh, you know, going to what the traditional bulk of the relevant audience has been, which is a lower income. For example, if you, uh, you know, I think some studies by Zero Divide show, Zero Divide Foundation, that if you're a Spanish-speaking Latino, no matter where you are, whether you're in L.A. or Fresno or Eureka, uh, if you're Spanish-speaking, your chances of being uh, wired in broadband are less than 30%. But if you're English-speaking Latino, your chances are 6% or more. You know, so, and then in the demo we have, which includes education, it's even better. It's 95% across Latino and uh, you know, African American and Asian. So there's the opportunity we're going. So we are going, we are segmenting deliberately. And I, I, I respect the question you asked earlier about, so then how does this come together? And I, I, I want to give you an email and send you the, the other uh, slides that, that I wish we could show. We, we wanted to show, we, we could have literally a lot of slides. <laughs> we would have a lot of research. Yeah. yeah. And so, but, but, so I think that we're, we're targeting a, 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 an educated class here of Latinos that, 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 uh, that are not being served, which we think, if you look at the, uh, how would you say, if there were to be a common denominator that that's traditionally has been for the past 30 years of public broadcasting, what would it be? It's education. Well, what's happening is it's, it's losing it. It's losing it. In other words, particularly with the ethnic communities. In other words, people with some college education are not going to public broadcasting, public media. So that's why this project is so important. I don't know if I addressed your question. But no, it's sort of right. I don't know if it's totally completely answerable at this point, right? Because we don't know whether that, that statistic is going to affect the ability even to have a mobile phone. Right. I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer to that is. And let me just add one more. We, our research firm also sent some research that showed that the, the greatest number of people here in L.A. who are on Twitter, Facebook, and MySpace are Latino. 
And it's not just because Latinos are the largest group, but again, it's what we've all been talking about. This is a group that's over-indexed in online and mobile. And so, for example, the, the, in, in number one uh, number uh, of people using MySpace, Latino. Number one people using uh, Facebook in LA, Latino. And so, it's, and it's this younger demographic. And we've also found that the 25 to 32, uh, they're even more larger uh, mass here in social media, mobile, and online. And like Ugo says, th these are people who have some college education and beyond. And so, yes, you know, this is often referred to as the lost generation also because of the economic uh, situation that we're in. But somehow they're making it work in terms of, you know, having access. So it's an interesting question. I mean, we'll be obviously be dealing with it, but uh, our, our audience is there. Felix? We're not going to have time for all the answers here because this ends at 1 o'clock. But I, for those of you who are interested, I have agreed to meet with my uh, Latino media class. So we'll be, when this wraps up, if you'd like to follow, we'll be in room 236. And we're getting some very good questions. You see them juggling for answers here. This shows that you're getting, you're getting good questions. <laughs> uh, the only thing I would add is that what's been shown I mean, in the past, Latinos have gone have followed content. When VCRs came out in the 1980s, there were low adopters of other technologies. But you could get videos and things you could not get other places. So the VCR adoption was, was higher up. Uh, cell phone usage among Latinos has always long outpaced uh, that of the general audience because of the quick connections. So I'd say put the magnets out there and see if it's strong enough, people will go to technologies that will do One last question or comment? Well, then I have one. Um, what You all are going to be hiring people, and as you flourish during this remarkable period in which you're um, well funded by CPD and will then be funded by these avid consumers of uh, this wonderful cohort you're targeting. So what would you look for in hiring uh, young talent that we should be thinking about here in this journalism? Definitely. I think, I think that's an easy one for me. Um, we're looking for smart Producers who um, you know, definitely have multi uh, multimedia experience. Um, we're looking for you know producers that are in our demo or close to our demo that um, you know that, that were that have their pulse on the, the communities that I've been talking about today. You know we'll probably we're going to end up hiring you know full range of staff you know everywhere from you know entry level. I'm getting ready to open up a, a, a PA position, a full time PA position like PA slash assistant. Um, to you know, associate producers, producers, um, on-air folks, reporters, hosts. So we're hiring the full gamut, and we're looking for you know people who are in tune and able to, to capture the pulse of these communities that we're that we're looking to represent. And think out of the box. We're looking for people who want to you know create something that's new. Exactly. And then mm -hmm. we'll connect with this with this demo. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like us or what? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.